Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Professor Lenka Zeverova from EPFL at Lausanne in Switzerland. Um, Lenka did her PhD in Paris Sud, Orsay, working with Marc Mezard and Vaclav Yanis. After her PhD, she has been a CNRS researcher at Sewa Saclay and uh, finished her Habila Tession at Ecole Normale Supérieure Paris. Um, last year, she moved to EPFL Lausanne as a professor in physics, where she is the head of the Laboratory of Statistical Physics of Computation. Among her many recognitions, uh, she won the CNRS Bronze Medal in 2014, Philip Mayer Prize and ERC Grant in 2016, and Irene Julier Curie Prize in 2018. So um, I had first heard about Lenka in Weizmann Institute in 2014. Uh, there I met a rather senior and outspoken German professor. And when I told him that I'm just starting my postdoc, uh, he literally told me, what are you doing here? You should go to Paris and work with Lenka. She is doing the most exciting thing in statistical physics right now. Well, Lenka has undoubtedly lived up to her reputation, and she has been working at the interface between statistical physics and machine learning and constraints satisfied with key problems in computer science. So today she will tell us more about this exciting emerging direction of research, and especially their connection to statistical physics. So with that, I invite Lenka to start her uh, seminar. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're, you're too nice. So, yes, so I'm, I'm very glad to be virtually at the Tata Institute. I heard a lot about it, never, never visited, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an honor. So, indeed, as, as, a, as a theoretical physics colloquium, I will be talking to you about uh, artificial neural networks and machine learning. So to, I kind of need to spend the first part of the talk kind of persuading you that that's you know, that's first of all, what's the theoretical questions in that topic? What are they about? And how does kind of a physicist's expertise and past things that we know from statistical physics help us to, to study this problem? So here, I just put a list of my collaborators. I like working to be with people. So it's becoming longer and longer. And in blue are those whose work I will be presenting uh, today and also the others. I mean, it's kind of an overview talk, so it's difficult to kind of choose some and not the others. So let me start with kind of the, 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 the type of a problem that we want to understand that we will be talking about today. So I choose this example you know, that, that, uh, that one often gives when explaining what machine learning is. Uh, which is, you know, teaching a computer to recognize photo of a cat from photo of a dog. So how do you do it? You start with a database of images. So you download thousands of images from the internet and with their labels. So for some images, you know that they are dogs. For some of them, you know that they are cats. So you have the image and with each image you have, you know, for instance, plus one for a cat and minus one for a dog. And then you want to write a computer program that will crunch these images. And at the end, return. And at the end, we'll be able to do the following thing. If you give it an image that didn't have any label, but it's an image of a cat or a dog, the, the program should be able to return plus one for a cat, minus one for a dog. So you think, you know, this is a, every child can do it. So how can it be so complicated to, to do something like that on a computer? So, but when you think about what, how computers see the images, right? So here is just a zoom on, uh, on uh, uh, not a very modern uh, TV where you see the pixels, green, red, and blue next to each other, many of them. So when you keep that in mind, you actually realize that the way the computer sees an image is just a long series of zeros and ones, and a tuples of them correspond to these three, uh, you know, these eight numbers correspond to one pixel, and then there are three of them for the three different colors, and then they go on and they go on, and neighbors are maybe similar because maybe the colors are not changing too fast from a, from a pixel to a pixel if they are next to each other, but it's this long series of zeros and ones. 
And now, if you, you know, now when you think of this program, the program that you are seeking is a function. It's really a mathematical function. You're seeking to, to, to find a way for the computer to find a function. So really think of, you know, function f of input x, where x is this long suite of zeros and ones that will output plus one for a cat and minus one for a dog. So when you think about it mathematically like that, you actually realize that it's not so simple. How should you possibly come up with a function like that? This looks uh, kind of complicated. It's not like any kind of mathematics that we kind of learned at university. Well, nevertheless, precisely this thing is casually today done with uh, deep neural networks. And so let me kind of walk you through the basics of how this works. And it's actually really simple. It's, it's super simple how actually um, deep neural networks work. And to explain it, let me just start with something even simpler, which uh, hopefully, you know, I would think all physicists are familiar with linear regression because at some point in our studies, we had to do experiments and measured some dependence of X on Y and then needed to fit a line. So when we are fitting a line through points, we are doing linear regression. So X would still be the, would be the data, the input data. And doing linear regression can be stated this way, that the function of X that you know, we are seeking will actually have a particular form that is simply a scalar product of the vector representing the data and a vector of coefficients of weights, W, that we need to be finding. So when you're fitting a line, you have you know, two parameters that you need to find, fit. So those would be the two components of this W. But you can, of course, have more than two. You can have uh, D of them. So that would be then D, you know, linear regression in D dimensions. So that's all very simple. And you have explicit uh, formula how to compute the, the best uh, W for that. Now we can generalize a little bit, but because a function like that, that is just a scalar product of two real valued vector, vectors will just return a real value in general. But in the cats and dogs example, we wanted it to return plus or minus one. So in order to take into some account something like that, we simply put a, put a function here and imagine this function to be a sign so that it's returning plus minus one. So doing that and finding a W so that for your input, the function returns uh, this, this ansatz for the function that will be called generalized linear regression. And now a multilayer or deep or neural network is just a rather straightforward generalization of this idea where instead of outputting this nonlinearity, this function times scalar product of your data times weights, you don't output this yet. You treat this as if it was the data again, and you continue the same procedure. You again do a scalar product with another, uh, this times a matrix of weights, and again, uh, component-wise, pass it through a nonlinear function si phi, which could be sine, which could be different types of nonlinear functions that are currently used. And you go on this way several times, each time you add this matrix of weights, we say that you add a layer. So here I have one, two, three, four matrices of weights that I will be fitting. This corresponds to four layers of a neural network. This is the input, this is the output of the neural network. So you see, it's just a kind of convoluted linear regression. It's, the, the idea is very simple. And then what stays to be said is how do we actually set these values of the weights, W? These are the coefficients that we need to fit. So the procedure for that is again, extremely intuitive and simple. All you do is you take your training set, that is this database of images of cats and dogs you started with. And then these Ys, I remind these are the labels. These are the plus ones for the cats and minus Ys for dogs. You define some distance, some, for instance, just difference of squares um, between these labels and the output of this function. And that distance then is, of course, parameterized by all these weight matrices W. So this defines a function that you can then minimize over the W. 
And how do sorry, how do you do that algorithmically, that minimization? You apply the kind of most straightforward thing that comes in your mind. It's a you know, it's a it's a continuous function of these uh, coefficients w. So you simply do gradient descent to minimize it. You just compute the gradient and change the w's to go a little bit in the direction or against the direction of the gradient and, and update them, compute the gradient in the new place, update, et cetera, et cetera. And that's it. That's what I just explained as the core of deep learning, core of machine learning today. You just need many labeled examples a big computer to run this minimization that usually use these graphical processing units, GPUs, and the algorithm that I described is stochastic gradient descent, where stochastic comes from the fact that you're usually not taking all your samples at once, but just a subset of them to compute the gradient. But it's a very kind of a simple recipe procedure to apply. And Can with this simple- question? I have sure. a question. Uh, how unique is L? I mean, is there a whole class of these uh, loss functions which? Uh, oh yeah, absolutely. There similar... is a whole zoology. Yeah, there but is a whole zoology a... of loss functions. But then, what do I trust? What do you take? Yeah, that that's kind of part of that question. It's like, what loss function do you take? How many of these layers should you take? How you know how how many of the how what are the dimensions of these matrices right the, 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 we are coming to the questions okay. so so i'm coming to the questions right okay. so so you just naturally have like one of those questions so currently it's done basically by engineering principles yeah? you just try things and some work better then you know you have a good measure of performance then you had this withheld set of images on which you know the labels, but you're not using them in the algorithm and then you check on them, right? So you have a very well-defined measure of performance. So you can then, you can optimize your procedure so that you perform well. And that's that's kind of how, you know, how machine learning field proceeded for, you know, since ever it existed. And in about 2010, made an amazing leap in the engineering way of doing things. And, and started doing things like, you know, here I have kind of an advertisement slide, right? People call it the fourth industrial revolution. We can solve Go, we can fold proteins, we can translate from any language to any language on Google Translate. And all those things are powered by what I just explained on the, on the previous slide with, you know, particular choices of all these, of all these parameters. And, and, you know, since we are in a physics colloquium, you probably didn't, you know, you probably have heard of machine learning also being applied to many questions in physics. You know, can it accelerate the process of doing science? Can we use it as a new tool in the box to do physics, to do science? And that's kind of a set of ideas that, that is being discussed quite widely since last maybe five years. So here again, I just give some you know, a review that we wrote, a conference that, you know, many, many conferences organized on the topic. So with, you know, kind of all this excitement and success, we can kind of now come, you know, we are in theoretical physics colloquium. So, so in theoretical physics, we have, for instance, the universe and we ask whether we understand it. Right? So in the same spirit, we have the system, this artificial neural networks, and we should ask as you know, human beings, do we understand actually why they work and what is happening? So what do we know about, about them theoretically? So first few things that you know, since uh, decades we do know. So we do know that this answers for a function that I showed you is generic enough in the sense that this, these functions corresponding to neural networks are universal approximators, meaning that there exists a set of these matrices, Ws, so that very generic functions can be actually very closely approximated by uh, such a functional form. So that's a good thing. You know, they are generic enough. The drawback here is a computational because when I say there exists, you should realize that how, how large these matrices are, right? The first one has the size that is the number of pixels, which can be say a million, times the width of the first layer, which can be also large, say thousands of, uh, of dimensions. And I can have several layers of these matrices. So I will have these dozens of matrices of size million times thousand or thousands times thousands. 
And now I am, I am optimizing with respect to every single matrix element of these matrices. So these, this is a huge space to optimize over, right? So this, if I had to do it exhaustively, it would take, uh, you know, any, any time you can, you can think of, it would take longer than that. So, and moreover, we know from the point of view of computation complexity theory, that indeed finding the minimizers of these functions is among the computationally hardest problems that we know of. This problem, you know, even a simpler neural network training, it is NP hard in the sense that for the worst input data and labels, we actually do not expect to have algorithms that would be efficient for finding these minima. But yet, you know, in practice, it works. If I go two slides back, all these, all these examples are examples where it actually does work. Maybe we don't find the minima, but we find something that is good enough. So, so, so that's kind of the big, the big mystery here. How do we recognize the tasks for which training the network is actually computationally doable? We know that there exists a W, but can we find the W? So this is, this is the, the fundamental question that you know, nobody today understands and that many people are trying to answer. And you know, just to say that, you know, this, as I said, this engineering project, progress happened basically in the last decade or last dozen of years or maybe 15 years. But these theoretical questions that underlie the neural networks. And here I will go a bit more in you know, less abstract terms and explain some of the questions more concretely. And this you know, little snapshot that I took, I actually took it from my article reflection after refereeing papers for NeurIPS. So that's the main machine learning conference still today, but it's a 26 years old uh, article. And the questions through which I will go, the theoretical questions about neural network here, well, they are pretty much the same ones that we are discussing uh, today uh, about neural networks. So just to go through them uh, quickly. So the first one, why don't heavily parameterized neural networks overfit the data? So why is this question kind of important and, and mysterious? So if I go back to kind of fitting points with the line, so you may have this kind of a sinusoid and you don't observe the, the, the red line, you only observe these points over here. And then if you actually try to fit, and here it's a neural network with two hidden neurons and five and 10, but you could also imagine a degree of a polynom, it would be pretty much the same picture, except that polynomes do not look like this, do look something else. But with too few, too, too little degree of a polynom or too few hidden units in, in the neural network, you will not be able to fit uh, such a function well. And then if you have somehow a sweet number of parameters, then you get a fit that is pretty good. And then if you have more parameters than that, then you actually get a fit that goes through the points, but it's off, you know, away from the points. So that's kind of a traditional bias variance trade of picture on which, you know, a lot of uh, learning theory and statistical inference and statistics kind of stands. This picture is actually completely off in neural networks. Because if I show the complete picture from, from a paper of actually two physicists also working on, on this subject kind of recently, and you take even more of these hidden units, even more parameters, so this sounds crazy, this sounds you should just fit the noise and learn nothing at all, you actually learn a function, the blue curve, that is basically perfect. So the more parameters you have, the, the better actually the model, model gets. It's not true that you overfit, it's not true that you fit the noise. Um, in the deep neural network. So that's kind of a first mystery that, you know, in, in the literature is these days called double descent or is associated to double descent. And actually, you know, wh why Breiman asks it in 95, because already in the classical papers on the bias variance trade of people actually did realize that this is quite the, the kind of traditional uh, thing that, that we teach students in the say se second year of computer science is quite not true for, for neural networks. Which brings me to the second question, which is 
you know, what is the effective number of parameters? Or in other words, if I go to some image processing example, like here, the, the classification of, pic of pictures in this sci-fi data set, where I have 50,000 pictures of uh, 10 different categories. And again, the computer is supposed to learn, you know, to recognize pictures that is a deer from pictures where there is a bird. So there is 5,000 pictures per category. That seems a lot. I mean, if you think of how many pictures a kid needs to say that, you know, what, to recognize a cat, maybe they need a dozen, but not 5,000. They probably didn't even see 5,000 pictures of a cat at a young age. So what is the actual number of samples that is needed? So nobody really knows the answer. Like we have the kind of what is working currently, but we don't know whether that is close to optimum. We don't know whether if it is not close to optimum, whether we can further improve the architectures or the algorithms or both or something else. And if I go like to one kind of highlight result of theory of learning, I will not go through the formula, just it's all said in the sentence is that the kind of the kind of golden standard of the theory of learning in computer science tells us that if we can find values of these weights w so that labels that are taken at random irrespectively who was cat and who was dog can be fitted cannot sorry cannot be fitted then we must be good at uh, at the task that we are training but so, so okay, and there is kind of mathematical theory underlying that claim, but the trouble is that so so traditionally people thought that okay, if we are bad at fitting random labels, then we must generalize. So the systems that we will be using, they will be we should design them in a way that they are bad at fitting random labels to be able to use this implication. But that's actually not the case. The current state of the art neural networks, and there is this. Uh, article from a few years back that is showing that the state-of-the-art neural networks are able to fit random labels very easily. So all these classical bounds on the how many samples is actually needed to learn a certain task, they are void and they are not actually saying anything about these systems. And finally, the third question here, you know, when working in physics of disordered systems and glasses systems where we study kind of how algorithms avoid, you know, how to equilibrate even in systems where the dynamics is slow, how to design fancy algorithms that would avoid local minima. You know, what I told you a few slides back is that in order to find the minimizer of the loss function, you just use gradient descent and that's it. No simulated annealing, no, you know, no variance of uh, Monte Carlo that would kind of be designed to jump over barriers or do something fancy, just gradient descent. It seems a little crazy. Nevertheless, that's the, that's the best algorithm we have uh, that is used in the state-of-the-art systems. And it's a mystery why, how comes that it actually works, that it's not stuck in some bad local minima. And we have, again, theoretical papers showing that bad, bad even global minima actually do exist and the algorithm can reach them, but it doesn't if we initialize it randomly and run it under the you know, classical circumstances. So that's another kind of a question that, uh, that people are kind of wrapping their heads around. So, this you know brings me deep learning is out there it works it's amazingly performant and it's fair to say that we have very poor or close to none understanding of the underlying principles of why it actually works we can explain how it works but we don't know you know we like i gave you the recipe but we don't know actually where it comes that it's all computationally tractable and has the performance it has so this brings me finally to the topic of the of the lecture. You know, we need to understand deep learning, and I just give here a, a kind of a little commentary piece that I wrote recently. That it's also a job for physicists. And why? Well, because as you know, as in physics, when we are faced with a system that does something and we don't understand how, well, we try to model it. That's what theoretical physics is kind of all about. 
So this is just a slide saying that in data science and statistics, the word model is used usually for the ansatz, for the function that we are fitting to the data. So it's a completely different kind of way of using it than what we do in, in theoretical physics, where, you know, for instance, the Ising model is kind of an abstraction capturing the essence of magnetism, even though it ignores a lot of the details of the magnetism, the materials, the quantum physics and all that, yet it kind of captures the nature of what magnetism is and where the phase transition comes from. And so with that in mind, we kind of, you know, build simple models of neural networks and try to learn from them. And the, 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 the kind of model situation that we often consider in, in statistical physics is you know, simplifying a lot of things and is this teacher student kind of uh, setting for a neural network. So what we try to understand is we have this teacher net neural network into which we will be feeding random IID data. So the data now will be completely artificial, just random IID vectors. Um, and then the weights of the teacher network, they will be also chosen at, as random IID and fixed to something. And this network will then produce labels. And then what the student network sees is the samples of the inputs and the labels, the outputs. It may also see the architecture of the network, meaning how many layers, how many hidden units, these are called hidden units, but it doesn't see the value of these weights. Its goal is to find the weights in some way, maybe equal, maybe something else, but in a way that the function is represented by this picture is the same for the student network to the teacher network. So here I already abstracted a lot of things away, for instance, all the structure in the data, you know, the network I will, you know, I can consider a simple one etc. So th this is very natural and you know it's not even like a recent thing. In physics actually a model like that the teacher-student perceptron has been studied since the late 80s. So notably it has been introduced in this paper by Gardner and Derrida in, in 89 in the simplest case where one in a sense looks at the generalized linear regression, no hidden units, just the input and the output. So again, in the form where the input data are IID Gaussians and the weights are also IID um, independent and identically distributed, and the labels come from a function that is just a sign of the scalar product between the teacher weights and the label and the input vectors. And in you know, high dimensional regime in the language of uh, machine learning, but the thermodynamic limit in the, in the language of physics, when the dimensionality of the data and the number of samples are both very large, but the ratio is fixed. And, you know, not only they introduced that model, but also realizing that actually looking at the model from the point of view of statistical physics or physics of disordered systems more particularly and doing the following dictionary that you know the position of the molecule in physics would just be the value of the weight in the neural network and the interaction between the molecules those would be the constraints between the labels and the input data and the inverse temperature would be you know played by the number of samples per input dimension and the physical dynamics would be this training algorithm that is trying to minimize the loss function. And, you know, some classical physical property of interest here will be the test error. That is how well is the function doing on this withheld set on which we are testing it. So with this in mind, you know, one can apply what methods that have been known already 40 years ago in the physics of disorder systems, notably in the physics of glasses and spin glasses, such as the replica, such as the replica method, and you know, if you if you heard about what what this is, or you know, students that learn that in say a master class, they can very readily apply this method to the simple neural network. It's it's in essence an exercise. It's a it's an example of a physics Hamiltonian for which you know we can apply uh, methods that uh, that have been applied before to hamiltonians that we are actually interested in statistical physics and indeed that has been done back then and 
you know, this 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 simplest case of this problem has been essentially solved on the level of the theoretical physics. And you know, jumping you know forward now to to, to a few years uh, ago, uh, when we went back to to look at these kind of systems, you know, we can we, in this paper what we did. So we generalized kind of that treatment from 40 years ago to include any activation function, not only the sign, but all those that are currently used in the in the state of the art systems, and also any 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 distribution or prior on the teacher weights. Uh, whereas before in physics, mostly people were considering either Gaussian weights or you know, spherical weights or binary ones. So any, any prior, this is, you know, we, we write a formula that for which the prior just can be plugged. Um, we also clarified kind of how the static statistical physics picture is related to the performance of the algorithms. And finally, these expressions that have been obtained from the replica method, which is you know, exact in the sense of theoretical physics method, but not rigorous in the mathematical sense, we actually proved that these indeed are uh, mathematically rigorous formulas. And rather than going into the formulas and into the details of these calculations or proofs, I kind of want to show you what you actually learn about that system. So, so here I will follow with three different examples of uh, how the teacher actually produces the labels and how the weights of the teacher are chosen, from which distribution they are chosen. So these are kind of the parameters of the simplest teacher-student neural network. And in the thermodynamic limit, I have a closed formula from which I obtain the red curve, which is the smallest possible error that any algorithm can achieve as a function of the number of samples per dimension. So the red curve is the optimum. And then I was saying that we have the understanding of what is the kind of best achievable, al algorithmically achievable result here via um, a type of message passing algorithms, which is this approximate message passing algorithm. And again, this is just a numerical check that indeed the performance of the algorithm here reaches the optimal curve. And the blue uh, squares, that's uh, some out of the box logistic regression, so a type of generalized linear regression. Uh, this one is taken from scikit-learn, which is just the classical package for data analysis. And here we are saying, you know, it's a generic kind of a method. It's not using any of the information that we actually put in our model, yet it's very close to optimality. So if this was always the case, we are, you know, we would be done, we could go home, but it's not always the case. It, it really depends on the details of the model. So here is another example. The teacher is still generating the labels using a sign function, but the ways the teacher uses are binary, plus minus one. And the meaning of the curse is the same. So the red is the optimal best error. The black is the performance of the approximate message passing algorithm. The blue is a out of the box algorithm. And green is a prediction of what the best algorithm can actually achieve. And we see that there is a gap there between what is algorithmically achievable and what would be information theoretically achievable. And that's you know, associated to you know, this drop of this uh, curve to zero corresponds to a first order phase transitions in you know, physical system. And the place where the algorithm actually starts working, it corresponds to the spinodal of that first order phase transition. And in between them, there is a hard phase that we believe is really intrinsically hard and no other polynomial algorithm can actually achieve good performance in that hard phase. And here is another example to which I will go back where this time, you know, you could think, okay, it's because the teacher was doing binary ways that is making things complicated. So not necessarily here, I have a teacher that is still using Gaussian weights, but what is changed is instead of the teacher giving the label that is sign, it gives you a label that is just absolute value of the scalar product, not a sign, just absolute value. And in this case, again, you find a hard phase between the optimal performance and the algorithmic performance. And here is just, okay, just to make the connection to the physics, 
you know, this, this hard phase is the kind of metastable, metastable uh, phase in systems with the first order phase transition and the kind of very well-known example that of, of a material that lives in a metastable state is, is the diamond, which at actually room temperature and uh, normal pressure should turn into graphite. It would, it would be much more energetically favorable if it turned into graphite. Nevertheless, it stays diamond for as, you know, as long as, as anybody is concerned, because it's very, you know, this, this metastable state is very stable. And exactly the same thing is happening with the algorithms, except that those are moreover living in systems that, in a sense, are not two-dimensional or three-dimensional, but are high-dimensional. So this metastability is really exponentially long-living. And that's kind of what causes these hurdles for the algorithms. And here is another kind of example of, uh, of why uh, in, in the simple model of machine learning where this hard phase can come from, it's really physically the same phase as, as when we have a super cool liquid that stays liquid and doesn't turn into ice, even though ice would be favorable and only turns into ice thanks to nucleation that in high dimension, we do not have nucleation. So in high dimension, it just stays in the bad phase forever. So yeah, maybe a good time for questions. Yes. Or, you know, mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. So I uh, missed the part. So oh, what would be the analog of different phases in these statistical mechanics systems with your algorithms? So one, I understand the metastability could reflect well how hard it is to achieve uh, the optimal set of the views. Yeah. They're an analog of different phases as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So sorry, I, let me go through it with more detail. It's that, yeah, the, the, the kind of the so here I interpret the ice as something that I you know, achieved. I want it to crystallize. And then the phase where the algorithm actually gets you zero error would be one phase. And the phase where the algorithm, uh, sorry, not the algorithm, let's, let's say where the, you know, irrespectively of the algorithm, where you can achieve zero error, that would be the possible phase. When you cannot achieve zero error, that would be you know, impossible phase that would correspond in a sense to the liquid. And then the intermediate, so then the phase transition would be this red line where you know, the free energy of the possible a big uh, phase becomes smaller than the free energy of the impossible. So that's the you know, thermodynamic one. And on the other side is this one, the thermodynamic one. But then the metastability is associated, since this is a first order discontinuous phase transition, the metastability is associated to the spinodal region next to it. So that's, that's the one that is kind of most, uh, most uh, kind of intriguing because it tells us something about the computationally difficult, computational difficulty of the algorithm. Does that uh, help? Yes, okay, thanks. Can I ask one question? Uh, so as far as I understood, you have taken uh, maybe one, two algorithms here, that's what you are showing. Probably it's known from the literature that they are good or very good in doing this kind of stuff. But uh, how do you know that this hard region is not because you have not found a better algorithm? I mean, is there a kind yes. of a mathematical proof or is it a conjecture? Yes, yes, no, that's a, that's a very good question. So. That's a, that's a conjecture, of course. If I had a proof of that, I would be on the way showing that P is not NP, so that's not going to be so easy. So why are we kind of, what makes us confident about that being true, right? So first of all, people have tried many, you know, I just spoke about this message passing algorithm. I will briefly get to the how the gradient descent actually deals with these systems. We will see that it's even harder for the gradient descent. But then there are other types of, you know, people tried many types of algorithms and classes of algorithms and also very different classes of algorithms such that the semi-definite programming types of algorithms that are, you know, in current theoretical computer science considered very kind of powerful classes of algorithms. And even those do not actually beat these thresholds. And they, you know, many of the good ones actually get to the same threshold for some of these classes of algorithms is actually highly non-obvious. Why do they actually get the same threshold? 
So that's a very that's a very deep question, and there is no like ex good answer to it anymore. But you know, by a lot of trial, nobody has been able to find an algorithm that would actually beat those thresholds that are, you know, the thresholds for these message passing algorithms to be more precise in systems that live in high dimension and where the replica solution is the exact solution to the to the system. Oh, I, I see. I see. But just, just to follow up on that, uh, are these sort of so Let me ask the question. Uh, uh, just can I ask a follow up just uh, for one, one second? Uh, does this ideas of annealing and stuff like that, which is used in, uh, you know, physics uh, and so on, do they help in any of this stuff or not really? I mean, um, so, so they don't, so in, for, for the setting as I'm describing here, where I'm really going after the, you know, I kind of didn't, didn't really show you what is the estimator that I am evaluating. I just said that it's the optimal error that corresponds in statistic to the base optimal estimator. For that estimator, the anything like simulated annealing, et cetera, is no helping. For this particular, you know, solvable model, the approximate message passing is the best we have and nothing else is helping. Now in different class of models, so for instance, uh, I will be then, you know, looking at the same problem, talking about the gradient descent, and that's a, you know, that's a, well, that's a gradient yeah. descent that is uh, evaluating a different estimator that is suboptimal if you actually didn't have this hurdle of computational difficulty, but mm -hmm. given that, you know, can maybe do better. So in those cases, uh, yes, yeah, simulated annealing could help. In practice, actually it doesn't for kind of reasons that are going back to, to these questions about why gradient descent is the one actually giving us the best test error. So yeah, I mean we could discuss that in more detail sure. if you if no, you're no, Yeah, yeah. Yeah, could I ask? Uh, so is there a proof that uh, machine learning is in NP? Yes. Yes, I mean that, yeah, that was what I went probably fast in in one of the first slides. Like that, even simpler. Even very simple neural networks are NP hard to to train. Yes, so that's you know how is that related? It's, it's in the worst case. So of course that means that there is an instance of an input, uh, input data and labels for which it is hard. But that's not what I'm doing here, right? Here here I derive I define this teacher. So student my question model. was about the proof of NP hardness. Uh, what does it involve? Does it maps onto something? Yes, I mean, eventually on? it maps to another NP complete problem. Right, okay. that's right. But that's for worst case data. Here, you know, the fact that I'm working on this teacher student model, I am in a case that I'm considering things to be true with high probability uh, over that ensemble. So, in a sense, this, this talks about average computational complexity. So, this concept of NP hard or not is not so uh, relevant here. I mean, it's a harder question to, to, to actually define a ensemble on the end of the NP hard, in, of the instantive of NP hard problems and ask is that ensemble with high probability hard or not? And that's kind of the more, in a sense, more practically relevant question, but much harder actually to, to tackle in theoretical computer science or mathematically, it's a wide open question. Like we have very few kind of generic principles on uh, on average over natural distribution computation complexity. Does it make sense? My question is very simple: Is uh, can you uh, who who was it who proved uh, machine learning is an NP? Uh, yeah, so there are, so the one that I was say, citing is Bloom, and there are several, but the papers back in the 90s, here I was citing Bloom and Rivers. It's um, Thank you. this one, for instance. But that's just an example. I mean, there, there are probably dozens of papers kind of on related computational complexity results. What was I here? Okay. 
May I ask a quick uh, question? I'm sorry. Yes, please do. Okay. The slide before, please. This one? Yeah. So uh, the red curve is uh, what uh, you are saying that is in principle possible, and the green one is what is computationally possible. Yes. And then you're saying that there is this. What is good? In this particular example that you were talking about, the black dots are the one that come from this approximate message passing algorithm. Correct. And that's the computationally optimal, you would say. Conjectured optimal, yes. yes yeah. So is there In the limit. why this specific algorithm does better than others or and does learning that help us understand why this hard phase exists? Yes, so that's that's kind of a, you know that's a that's a that's a question that I'm asking myself like a lot, <laughs> all the time. So that's like yeah, we, we don't really know, but we are kind of working towards uh, putting more uh, evidence towards this. I mean, this conjecture seem you know this co conjecture is persisting now for for years and years, like many trials of people who would try to design better algorithms, and they are. So the, the, the kind of theoretical work towards the question that you are asking goes through defining a broader classes of algorithms and showing that no other algorithm in that class can actually improve upon this one. So this has been done, for instance, for the class of local algorithms, which in theoretical computer science also, you know, for a while were considered, still are maybe for some problems quite powerful. And actually these, um, these results based on hardness in, if you want, some kind of spin glasses systems, which uh, you don't remember which were the systems where this was proven first. Now there is a dozen of such proofs. But in a sense, showing that actually these type of algorithms provably fail in uh, related problems in this hard phase, that was kind of an important theoretical computer science result that you know disproved some of the conjectures that people were having previously. Another class of algorithms for which they are uh, they are uh, kind of good uh, good evidences and proofs uh, is a class of first order methods in which you know it's kind of a generic generalization of the gradient descent. And AM, an approximate message passing, and of a class of algorithms that encompasses these two and, and many others. And there is a proof that among that class, you know, this particular one is again the best one, that it cannot be improved. But that's still, you know, that's still very partial. That's that's kind of a big challenge in theoretical computer science to actually enlarge those classes of algorithms and show that also other algorithms are somehow stopped by this spin order of a first order phase transition. Thank you. Thanks a lot. That's less about the, that's less about neural networks. If you want, I have um I have a talk that is more about these hard faces that I can send you a YouTube link. That, yeah, thanks. That yeah, was thanks. at the yeah. If you send me a mail, I will be happy to to send you that link. Or anything, any other references more concretely. Okay, but so let me just go um really fast through kind of you know I, I showed you like some some uh solvable model of this very simple neural network but kind of you know so far you know i kind of gave you a big introduction with a lot of open questions and you were probably uh, expecting that i will answer some of them so so far i didn't much right how is this bringing us or is what i showed you so far bringing us towards the theory of understanding of deep learning so if I kind of look at what is needed to, 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 to get the theory of deep learning, one needs to account, right, as always in physics, we start with some, re something re some really simplistic model which doesn't capture maybe at first the, all the essential part of our systems. And then we kind of look what is missing in the model and we try to put it in and still understand how the model behaves. So here are kind of the three essential ingredients of uh, these neural network, these deep neural networks that that need to interplay together to make the whole system work. And what is this? This is the structure in the data, the fact that 
the data are not just IID vectors, that they are, you know, pictures of cats or pictures of dogs, that there is some structure in these pixels that actually makes the problem computationally tractable because as per the questions and as per what I was saying, we know that for the worst data, the task is not computationally tractable. So there must be some magic property of the data that makes it computationally tractable. So can we create a model that will help us identify what property of the data actually makes the task tractable? So there's this one side of this triangle. The other side of the triangle is the algorithm, right? As you were remarking, I was telling you about behavior of approximate message passing algorithms because those are kind of naturally related to the phase transitions that we can identify in those problems. And we you know, can analyze them, but I was also telling you that in machine learning, we are using gradient descent. So how actually these two algorithmic classes relate and how does the gradient descent work? And finally, this whole architecture. So that was the question, how do we choose the loss function? How do we choose the number of layers? How do we choose the width of the layers? How do we pick these nonlinear functions? I mean, there are so many choices when we actually want to set up this system. How do the details of these choices actually influence the tractability and what's going on? And so far, I was very, very shallow in all these three directions, right? The data that we were treating were IID and I had no hidden units and I was telling you about these message passing algorithms. Whereas we would need to look at realistically structured data and multiple wide layers and gradient based algorithms. So in the past, uh, say five, six years in, in, in my group we, and many other colleagues around, we have been working towards these, uh, these from the blue things to the green things in, in my picture here. And, and I just want to very, very schematically kind of show you our progress in each of the three directions. So I will start with the one where we know the least actually uh, currently. There's the one about hit, you know, adding hidden units into the whole picture. So we can add a few hidden units into the model and that would be called the committee machine. Again, a, a, a model introduced and studied in physics in the nineties uh, that we revisited recently. And again, you know, made the connection to the algorithmic uh, algorithmic complexity and, and prove the underlying formulas and, and discussed some, some insights that we get already from this model. Even with just two hidden units, we can, we can highlight some properties that are seen in practice such that depending on how many samples you have, at first you can only learn a function that is simpler than actually the function that you are representing by your network and only if you have more samples than a given threshold that is called the specialization threshold, you actually can take advantage of the fact that you have some hidden units and that your function can be more complicated. So, so that kind of intuition is exemplified in this exactly solvable model, the committee machine. And again, in the committee machine, as we have more and more hidden units, we are finding these computationally hard phases so, so we know how to say a whole bunch of things about that system. And here will be like a few more references along those lines. But the bottom line is that so far we only, you know, the, the thermodynamic limit that we are defining where number of dimensions is large and number of samples is large, their ratio is fixed. We can so far only treat in detail with order one of hidden units, whereas we would like the hidden layer to be wide and there are some kind of complementary works that are on the contrary dealing with infinitely wide neural networks that you know that then become in a sense too simple and equivalent to just a linear model again so that's maybe less interesting deep linear networks can be treated explicitly but they are linear so they are not as ex they you know you need these nonlinearities in for the for the functions to be uh, universal approximators so so none of these directions in essence that currently there are is really satisfactorily describing the, the multiple wide layers. And on the other two directions, we are a bit more uh, successful so far. So for instance, uh, for the gradient descent based algorithms. So this is something that 
that uh, in the past years we, 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 we developed methods and understanding that that is quite uh, good. So I wanted to show you on the example of the phase retrieval, which is you know, the, the, what I showed you already, where the teacher was generating the labels using an absolute value. And this picture was you know, describing how many samples does the approximate message passing algorithm need with respect to the information theoretically optimal. But then you, know, you can ask, OK, how many samples do I need if I just run the gradient descent? And you will find that actually, so this is, first of all, what is the gradient descent? This would be the specific loss function that I consider. And the gradient descent is you know, the, what you would expect. You just take the gradient. And here, I'm just adding a, adding a spherical constraint on the, on the weights, which is called weight decay in, in machine learning. But I actually do not have to do it. I just, for convenience, do it. That's, that's the algorithm that we are considering. And if we actually run it, uh, uh, and plus the fraction of instances in which we reach uh, you know, success, then we see that the number of samples we need for this algorithm, this is again, this alpha is bigger, much bigger actually, it's maybe like seven and these curves are even shifting to bigger and bigger alpha as the size is growing, maybe even with the log, but even if we somehow imagine that they're stopping they will be stopping at something like seven or eight, meaning you know, if I just summarize, that the number of samples the approximate message passing needs is just 13% more than the dimension, whereas the gradient descent would need something like seven times more. So, so it's much worse. So why are we using an algorithm like that? It seems much worse. So the the one of the you know one of the answers is in the in the over parameterization. So I was explaining this question of why heavily over parameterized neural network do not overfit the data, which was an observation that the over parameterization doesn't hurt us. But not only doesn't hurt us, it actually helps the algorithms. And you know, it makes the optimization problem easier without actually losing the fact that the test error is still good. And kind of the combination of the two is um, is uh, is very surprising uh, after you know, you think about it, and so to to give like piece of one more evidence to that, we actually can analyze this explicitly in this phase retrieval problem. We can actually consider a loss function that corresponds to the overparameterized neural network. There's the same one as before, except that here I add the sum over the m hidden units, and I need number of hidden units that is larger than the dimension here. And again, skipping over the details that are the theorems in the paper, I actually uh, find that the gradient descent in the over parametrized neural network only needs twice the dimension of samples instead of seven. So the over parametrization helps. With that, the neural networks need fewer samples to, to generalize well. And you kind of realize that this is a property that is specific to the usage of the gradient descent. It helps the gradient descent. It doesn't help in no way the approximate message passing. That's, you know, that one does not get improved by the over parameterization. On the contrary, it will maybe get harder by the over parameterization. So, so, so that's kind of one, you know, piece of, of results towards uh, resolving some of the, some of these questions and mysteries. And again, I just for your future reference, some some of our recent works along these lines. And so I put that here in Sorry, I, blue. Sorry, last question, yeah. uh, Linka. So the the observation, uh, your observation about gradient descent and um, how it's being helped by over parameterization does is it the um, is it more or less structure independent of your structured data? Did you have you observed it? Uh, no, in yeah, the... of course, that's not structure independent. No. So that particular result was still for the for the IID Gaussian inputs. And all the results are with high probability with respect to that the distribution. Now it does get uh, influenced by the structure in the data. That's kind of the third third part here of, of the triangle that you know that we ex I want to, you know, if I have, I don't know, maybe I should 
the time is out, but there were some questions the organizers should stay. I could also stop here, or I can say you a few more words about the, the structured data. That influence, you actually not, and actually, no, actually, yeah, I didn't want to do it anyway. I just, okay, we can also no. deal with the structure. We can take data, 10 more minutes, give you the... it's fine, Lenka. No, but that's fine because yeah. I, I just gave the references here. Just to say in a few words that we do know how to account for, we do understand thanks to this series of works, what properties of the input data, what 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 part of the structure actually influences the properties of the learning with uh, this generalized linear regression? So if we learn with neural networks without hidden units or with order one hidden units, that were the two ones that I was describing that we understand well, we, you know, as per past two years, also know which part of the structure of the data actually influences that. And in particular, this learning curve, like what is the test error as a function of the number of samples here. Now we have a theory that actually there's the line that can match exactly the learning curves that we actually obtain from an actual data set, which here we took the MNIST data set, which is something that people often use, especially in theory papers. It's a very simple uh, real data set. So we we do know that now the so so we know currently how to reproduce this learning curve. So in principle, we can now go back and analyze the gradient descent for this generic structure as well. But this we haven't done yet. So that's okay. That's a kind of a long way around to answer your your question, Rishi. So so there is no paper on that yet. But in principle, we would know how to do that. But it has not been done yet. But it will depend on the structure of the data. Okay, yeah, thanks. Can I can I ask because, uh, some yeah. question, uh, if you don't mind? Uh, can you yes. move a few slides back where you had an equation actually? Just uh, this one. Yes, this one. That's right. So I mean, uh, you are trying to make analogies with uh, physics. So this uh, this uh, w dot is equal to gradient of L equation. I mean, as a physicist, uh, would I'm sure you, I, I, I don't work in this area. So these are very naive questions. The two, two, two questions. One is that uh, why wouldn't I have a W double dot term, you know, like a underdamped type of Langevin equation, yep. or I should have a noise term is a natural so, thing to yep. do. So yeah, so actually that's all, that's all done. So the, 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 the mass term, the W, yeah. Two dots is yeah. called momentum. I mean, momentum, you know, that's that's quite physical. It's called the gradient descent with momentum in, in machine learning. And that is actually, so under some circumstances, this is helping. There is a whole zoology of the variants of these gradient descent based algorithms under what circumstances there are actually, um, uh, different variants are actually better. So it's, it's almost like literally like zoology in the sense that it depends on the architecture, it depends on the data and every paper has different architecture, different data. So then, you know, the details. So, so we actually, I have a master's student working on the phase retrieval problem, kind of trying to make sense of, of the zoology. The noise is absolutely, the noise people also put it, not in the form that we would expect in physics, right? In physics, we usually put the Langevin type of noise, just add yes. uh, white noise. Right. In, in machine learning, the kind of noise that seems to be really doing something good, again, for reasons that uh, people are just uncovering, including us, including many others, is the type of noise that Oh, here the gradient I write it with respect to all with respect to uh, well, this loss here is a sum yes. over all the samples and I make a derivative of the full loss. Yes. The type of noise that people put is that at every time step they actually subsample they take a small subset of these samples and they do the gradient with respect to that small subset and next time step they take a completely different subset. So that's the stochastic gradient descent. That's the type of noise that people study in, that people use in practice in machine learning. From a physics point of view, it's a kind of an interesting, I don't know, maybe you could call like a driven system. It's a type of dynamics that uh, 
that we are now studying that is very interesting from kind of the point of view of dynamical systems, but that, you know, doesn't come up naturally anywhere in physics as far as I know. So it's an interesting type of kind of non-equilibrium uh, physics uh, systems there. And, and, and in a sense, the, the reason why this type of noise, for instance, seems to help more than the Lanzevan type of noise is still kind of uncovered. In, yeah, like we are, for instance, questioning like already in these toy models, does it actually help more? And so far in the models that we studied, it seems that yes, but for reasons that uh, that seem that still remain obscure to us. I see. Thank you. Thank you very much. But yeah, there is, you know, there is a lot of opportunity for kind of uh, if you if you study dynamical systems in physics, like this is a very intriguing dynamical system about which so very little is known so far. So yeah, I mean, I was kind of anticipating that I will not have time to go to this third part. So that's why I just give you one picture and, and the references. And I just leave the, the last slide with the, you know, okay. I'm kind of happy about our, you know, I, I didn't put anything in green. That's, that's, I should put still, it's not that we are kind of, that we entirely understood the structure of data and entirely understood the role of the algorithm, but, um, but it's not the two sides that are currently blocking further development. It's, it's this side of kind of being able to tackle the type of correlations that come up if we actually have multiple layers in the neural network. So the system, you know, from the physics point of view, we are dealing here with the kind of mean, you know, high dimensional, so mean field type of systems. It stays high dimensional if we add hidden units, but it creates a type of correlation that the kind of replica mean field type of analysis, we are not sure whether it can actually tackle it. It seems difficult. We don't know how to do it on kind of the level of uh, exactly solvable model yet. So that's where we stand currently. And, um, and I hope that, uh, that I at least intrigued you into, into that claim that understanding deep learning is also a job for physicists because it's a immensely interesting complex system where a lot of uh, physics can, can actually be applied and, and studied. And I will stop here. And I'm happy to take more questions. Those are really interesting questions. Okay, thank you, Lenka. Uh, let's thank Lenka by either using the action button or you can unmute and thank Lenka. Okay, yeah, we can have more questions. Please uh, raise your hand in the participant window. Yeah, okay. Uh, I see Rajdeep. Please go ahead. A uh, very nice talk and very uh, very informative talk. I had just one question, which is probably not exactly on your talk, but uh, you know, on the general issues of deep learning and so on. So there's been a lot of talk about how, you know, once you're trying to use some of these uh, algorithms for more, uh, you know, applied things like you know, doing things for society and so on. Uh, the biases that are there in your data also creep into the outputs that you get and people at least in various ethical, uh, you know, communities have been worried about uh, how that happens. So my question was, is there also a more mathematical formulation of that problem or is it more empirical where people see that there is some, you know, Oh, you get this algorithm yeah. and it doesn't do that. So yeah. Yeah. So so yeah, that's a that's a kind of really important emerging direction in which I'm not like touching so much in a sense, right? I mean the part I mean I'm interested in the theory and then I'm interested in the applications in sciences where which are maybe less socially socially sensitive. But mm -hmm. to actually answer your question, um that that in a sense I see it as an opportunity for computer science, right? In the sen in the same sense as as cryptography and security kind of could have seemed like abstract notions without any much of formalization, say hundred years ago. Today these are just 
kind of fully fledged developed parts of computer science. So I believe that things like fairness or biases that, you know, currently at least like the little I know about it, I perceive it more kind of, you know, discussions that would maybe more belong to social sciences rather than mathematics and computer science. But I think that's kind of a, you know, backward way of seeing it. I think what it, what's actually happening is that that people in computer science are working into actually formalizing these notions into exactly, you know, what you're suggesting, kind of more formal mathematically defined statements. And and I don't know where that is yet, but I mean, there is definitely progress. And if they manage, right, we can be looking for like an entirely kind of new part of computer science and mathematics, which looks interesting. And then of course, I mean, definitely from the practical point of view, these are these are super important questions if we are actually to deploy these systems, not if we are, we are already deploying these systems all over the place, right? I mean, articles in journals are being written by by transformers and uh, and who knows how they are influencing the society so so we need to understand all this much better so yeah as, as a scientist i see it as an opportunity i'm not like so worried but uh, but i understand no, I, I was wondering public. whether people have already looked at this opportunity and, and you kind of answered my question about where the field is so yes it's it's not easy it's not so easy to kind of find your way through it because the field is so big and so active and you just find a lot of things that seem a bit shallow oftentimes but mm -hmm. i believe it will just like take time that people kind of re extract the, the kind of deep things that actually are advancing things forward and and I think we are getting there, but uh, one needs to dig, one needs to get interested really in detail to 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 be able to do that. Yeah, I I wouldn't be able to point you to what is like the most interest, most relevant work in that direction. There is so much. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, yes, Lenka, it's very nice to us. In the seminar. So, um, you know, in statistical mechanics, we often think about in the sense of more macroscopic, like coarse graining, uh, hydrodynamics, or even free energies. So, when you're looking at your evolution of these parameters, Ws, is there some sense you could think in a macroscopic way? Is there some macroscopic understanding of what would be the uh, optimal set of Ws that it will converge to and what's their dynamics? Yes, yeah, so that's that's kind of what, what what one is kind of aiming at when writing the statmic, right? In a sense, so in these simple systems that I described, what you end up doing is that you you just you the the kind of the whole how your error depends on the number of samples ends up depending just on few order parameters in which you kind of summarize the vector of weights or the matrix of weights. Right, so that's that's kind of what uh, that sounds natural to 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 a statistical physicist. In some of these works where you actually are able to deal with a very wide but only one hidden layer, um, well, some people call that line of work mean field limit, which is very confusing. I like much better to call it hydrodynamic limit, where the 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 quantity on which you write your equations is actually the the density of the weights uh, over the different hidden units, and and then you get a type of differential equation that is that is related to the Vlasov equation or some equations used in in like fluid dynamics. That's why the hydrodynamic limit. So so yes, that's that's kind of in essence on a high level uh, the type of thing that one is aiming to do. Now it. The, the kind of what we still don't know how to do well is how to actually do that properly without losing anything important for the multi-layer neural networks. So that's kind of not known. Like there are of course many attempts, but none of them that would kind of solve the issue, in my opinion. Okay. Thanks. Okay, good. Uh... I do not see any other hands. Okay, I think there are no more questions.
so thanks lanka again for a wonderful talk uh, thank you everybody for being yeah. here and for the questions yeah